Are we actually using these? Oh, we are. Yeah, they don't have to be moved or anything. They're just, they're just picking yeah, it up. Yeah, but don't we need one for the audience? Sure. So they can be heard? Yeah. Okay. So I am. So, yeah, so then take them off. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us for the panel. I'm Milta Ortiz, and I work with Borderlands Theater. I also happen to be the playwright. Um, and I'm just here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I'm here to welcome you back and to also let you know that we are live streaming the panel. So it could be, it might be being watched everywhere around the world, possibly. Um, so we would love for you to participate and ask questions, and we have a, a microphone there that I'll, that I'll be holding. And so if you want to ask a question, um, come up to the mic and, and ask your question. And so it, the mic is not actually live here. It's feeding into the live streaming. So for the panelists, um, we, will we will pass the mic around so that everybody can be heard. And um, cool. So I'll hand it over to our wonderful moderator, Tina Cross. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I just want to say good evening to all of you, and thank you so much for coming and sharing in this uh, historical moment in our church. But the, before we get started, I have a very special request. I really don't want to have to talk to you way back in the back, so if you don't mind moving forward, and let's be a community here uh, together, that would be greatly appreciated. Come on over from, th from the banco, and uh, there we go, that's better. I mean, I don't think folks are gonna bite each other here, okay? Um, I, I was quite surprised when I was, well, I was asked to be, I thought, on the panel, and then I saw listed that I was the moderator, and I'm saying, okay. Um, and so I've been really thinking about, you know, how to present all of this to you. And I, I feel like that for you to best know how Eliezer and uh, Reverend Allison Harrington have become a part of this community of faith is to have a little bit of a history. And so I'm going to just give you a capsule of where we've come from, what has brought us to this day that provides the backdrop, that provides the life, that provides the vision for them to be able to function here. Southside was started as a mission church of, for the Presbyterian Church in approximately 1903, uh, and they met in a tent. Uh, and in two, and 1906, they built their first chapel. And if you had a chance to see the pictures out in the foyer, you will have seen those structures. The church burned down in 1937. And uh, the Presbytery thought, well, OK, we'll just leave it. And, but the church.
showing the true faith and So I, except for one other person that is still alive and in the congregation now, uh, there are the two of us that have been a part of this congregation for this period of time. Uh, Reverend Salmon was here until 1956. 1956, we had Reverend Casper Glenn. He was a black minister, and he was active in the civil rights movement, brought us, the congregation, into the civil rights movement, he was president of the NAACP here in Tucson. And we picketed and we marched for those areas of public accommodation that were segregated at that time in Tucson. He was here until 1964. There was a period of time that we were in flux. We did have another minister for a couple of years and then we were. It was called to basically get us on our feet because it was at a point that the church was about to close its doors. And uh, John presented himself to the session that still existed at that time and to the presbytery and asked for a period of time in which to get the congregation back into a functioning organization. And so he came in approximately 1969 so and was here then for 35 years i unfortunately did not have the pleasure and privilege to actually be here during the 80s and the sanctuary movement i visited the church uh, usually every six months i was living in california at the time and my family still was here so therefore i came home and knew what was happening, saw some of the refugees that were here in our, our sanctuary. And um, then we had our major, because we wanted to have showers for the refugees that were here, um, that was the idea for this kiva, which finally came about. The showers are there, but then we also ended up with a new kiva, a new worship center. And so that's kind of a capsule. But as you can see, there has always been, from the very beginning, that basis of social justice, that basis of taking care of your neighbor that has been a part of the life and the love and the faith of this congregation and has provided the foundation for the community organizations that still function or came out of working in this congregation. Eliezer Castellanos is one, he is the leader with the Worker Center that started 11 years ago on the, here in order to provide individuals with a safe place where they could get work and be able to provide for their families. And I'm going to allow him to talk more about the program and his role and what they do with the Worker Center. And also it is my privilege to introduce our pastor, Reverend Allison Harrington. And <laughs> she has now in uh, 2019, uh, 2019 will have 10 years with us. And so we're really very pleased. And she comes with a long length of credentials, which God has prepared her for this crazy congregation of Southside Presbyterian. And I'm not going to go through that litany. And then she will talk to you about her activities with the congregation here at Southside and then the current day sanctuary. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to Eliezer, and he can talk to us about the work center. Estoy nervioso, siempre ha sido así. De nervios desde el momento en que uno viene aquí. It's always, I, I'm always been nervous 
when I start working, I start working on this place. I didn't know it was a sanctuary. I didn't know it was a safe place for the workers. But once I, I knew it, I stick up. I said, this is a place This is the place siempre tiene que existir un lugar como este. Disculpen mi inglés. <laughs> Tengo más de 20 años en este país y no lo puedo hablar bien. But it was a pleasure for me to be a member of the Southside Worker Center. The Southside Worker Center started in 2006, and I came to this country in 1996. Things were way better than 10 years ago. But suddenly, uh, Everything started going bad for everyone here. Ten years ago, um, 2010, uh, so many anti-immigrant laws become on this state, and many things change. We start having so many problems finding jobs people losing their jobs because their status. We didn't have an A national leader in the immigrant rights movement, he was a participant in the Undocubus, which was a version of like the freedom rides that went through the southern part of the United States up to the Democratic National Convention um, to protest the uh, deportations happening under the Obama administration. And um, he was arrested then um, which is very courageous for undocumented people to be arrested. <laughs> um, and he does many things. He, he, he runs OSHA trainings. Our men have OSHA trainings, which is so good to keep them safe on the job. Um, but so I just want to say just a few words um, about what we do today. Um, and then we'll, we can have a few minutes for questions. But I'm just so privileged. And every time I see this play, at the end, I always cry, Milta. I'm always like, oh, my goodness. Um, because I'm just, th this congregation is just an amazing amazing congregation and it's who they are and it has nothing to do with me. I'm just like happy to occupy that office right over there. Um, but it's a deeply um, um, hospitable congregation and it's not just about refugees but it's about um, the homeless that come here um, twice a week to get fed. It's about um, providing a sanctuary space for day laborers to gather. It's about the multitude of ways in which we allow um, community groups to use our space. Um, I think this is a perfect, having Borderlands here is an example of that, that spirit of hospitality. Because the thing I want to say about hospitality is it's not easy ever. Um, you know that um, just entertaining people in your home during Thanksgiving, you have maybe folks come over and it's nice for like a day and then it's hard. <laughs> and so having a whole stage set up here is hard. Um, it like makes life just a lot more complicated, but the blessings are so amazing when we're able to really open up spaces to allow other people to, to dwell with us. And so the blessings always far. Um, and so the congregation, even when I was like, well, we're gonna have this whole setup. Like nobody ever, I think, I feel like other congregations would be like, no, we can't do that. Every, everybody I spoke to knew it was going to be hard and it was going to be awesome at the same time. <laughs> and it has been. Um, so sanctuary is still very much part of our ethos here. Um, in 2014, um, we were part of reigniting the sanctuary movement un as the deportation rate soared under the Obama administration. We opened our doors to Daniel Neo Ruiz. Um, and then to Rosa Robles Loreto, and we were part of building a, a national network of churches that were responding to those deportation rates. And we were largely successful, both here locally and nationally, um, in getting people's cases closed um, and finding relief um, for a variety of people. Um, and we were, we were, we were doing great, um, and the network was growing, and there was about 400 congregations involved. And then, like, this really weird thing happened, and we elected a fascist dictator <laughs> 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 to, 
to be president, which is not a laughing matter at all. Um, but a funny thing happened um, when when uh, the president, the Trump was was elected. Sanctuary grew like that. Um, by by the time of his inauguration, we had almost a thousand congregations who were pledging to do the work of sanctuary. Um, and c- we currently have 1,100 um, congregations across the nation who are engaged in the work of sanctuary. Um, and we have um, 50 people living publicly in sanctuary. There are a lot of people today living across the United States living privately in sanctuary. Um, but we realized this time that sanctuary as a concept needed to expand because it wasn't enough for a congregation to say, we're sanctuary, come find us if you need us, um, and just kind of wait for someone to show up. We needed to go outside the walls of the church to make sure communities were sanctuary spaces, that schools were sanctuary spaces, that homes were sanctuary spaces, so that nobody had to enter into sanctuary, because sanctuary is a horribly hard thing in terms of how it's being practiced um, these days. It's, it's different than the 80s in terms of how it's being practiced. And so we found um, that, we were, that we were really encouraging um, churches to get more engaged with their local day labor center, make sure your day laborers, you know where they are, they're protected. Um, work with your local legal clinic, work with your local immigrant rights organization, and do whatever you can to support directly affected leadership, um, and wh- whatever that means. And one of the things that we've been talking to, you know, a lot of times um, pastors, especially white pastors, um, they want to rush in and be the hero um, and be like, I'm here to save you. Um, and one of the things we've been telling people is, is that you don't really need that <laughs> um, because people are saving themselves. Um, but what people needed, and one of the things that we learned was um, that when we asked people, the thing that they needed was child care. Um, because mamas and daddies were coming together at these meetings and they needed child care. And when we offered, when we started offering that, people were like, really? They weren't like impressed with like sanctuary. <laughs> They were like, oh, you'll do child care for us? That would be amazing. And it was a powerful way to kind of subvert power dynamics that have long existed, especially between women of color and white women. Um, women of color mostly historically taking care of the, the, uh, the children of white women. And so we're able to subvert that paradigm and take a back seat and uh, support the leadership of others. Um, and so the work has, has continued and deepened. Um, and, and kind of, again, following the leadership of directly affected folks who were also saying it's not enough for a city to say they're sanctuary and then keep doing police enforcement in the same way that they've been doing it. And it was the movement for black lives that really were help, was helping us understand this as we were um, once again aware of the way in which police patrol certain neighborhoods in different ways. And so that, that call to expand and deepen sanctuary has been something that has been felt, I think, across the nation and, and especially here. And so, t- so today we continue the work, um, trying to find ways to, um, to work alongside those who are directly affected following um, their leadership, doing things like making sure the, um, the Board of Supervisors here in Tucson um, refuses funding for Operation Stone Garden, which um, gives uh, Sheriff's Department more money to, to aid in immigration enforcement. So doing things like this to make it so that every community is a sanctuary community. Jim Corbett wrote a book um, called, oh, I'm not going to remember it, because I've never read it, and I actually looked for it on Amazon, and it's like $200, because it's like out of print, so I'm probably never going to read it. But they had this, they had this it, it, back in the 1980s, they wrote this letter to the judge at the time of indictments, and they said, um, basically, we'll continue this work until all of the earth is a sanctuary. Um, and so we, um, we try to hold true to that and continue the work um, until no one has to live inside a church um, out of fear for being torn from their family. Thank you. Thank you very much. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Okay. So we only have a few minutes left. And uh, so does anyone have a question of either Eliasar or uh, Reverend Allison Harrington? I have a question, a couple of questions. Um, What is a kiva? We're inside a kiva, but um, what is it? You want me to explain it? Okay. The Kiva is is a Hopi um, worship center in the earth. And the design was something that Reverend Fife uh, wanted to maintain the foundation of our church for the peoples that it was originally planned for, which was our, our Native Americans. 
uh, our Indian population, and originally th they were called Papagos in this area. Although this is Hopi, this came from, uh, from the New Mexico area. And as you can see, there is the opening at the top, and we uh, basically, you would have to climb down that into the ground for their worship and meditation. Since we all can't do that, uh, we just have that, you know, fox opening up there, and we have the design that takes us down uh, from the level earth outside in order to do that. We have the natural pines, we have the saguaro ribs in the, the so we wanted to use uh, all of the natural kinds of building materials that is, is used by the uh, native peoples in this area. Thank you. Great, thank you. Is there a question? Um, because I, I had a question about, uh, you mentioned that you had people in sanctuary here, Allison. Um, Rosa, how long was she in sanctuary and what was the outcome of that? She was in sanctuary for 461 days. Not that we were counting the days. <laughs> 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 um, the outcome, um, so she was, um, she was, we reached an agreement with the government that she would be safe um, to leave. Um, and so it was, yeah, it was a long 461 days. Sarah Lanius is here, who is an amazing community leader who was part of, was, we wouldn't have been able to do that work with, without her brilliance. Um, and so it, w it was a long 461 days. But I think it, for me, it was a day, uh, it was a time when I learned what true solidarity means. Um, because there was times when it was like we had tons of press and um, congressmen would come and visit us. Linda Ronstadt would come and visit All these people come visit. And the prayer vigils would be huge. And then there was days when nobody seemed to care. And in those days when everything seemed hopeless and you decide not to quit and you decide to stick with it and to stand with somebody, that's when solidarity is not when it's easy. Um, and that's what we forget. We think it's going to be when it's easy, but it's really true solidarity comes when it's really, really hard. And just to break down what it means to have somebody in sanctuary, or what can you explain that? Yeah. So um, it's interesting that the first... Um, practice of sanctuary in the United States articulated as sanctuary was actually during the Vietnam War when conscious objectors um, would take sanctuary in a congregation and church to avoid the draft. Um, they were then actually, police came in and, and, and dragged them out of the churches, which ca caused this huge public outcry at this, at this image. So it was around that time that the government decided that churches and congregations would be considered sensitive locations. Um, and so that's one of the protections that, that a church has, that law enforcement is going to be limited um, in terms of how it's going to operate. Um, but really it harkens back to, um, um, to, to, reli to, to biblical kind of mandates um, and, and, and continue on through the, through the Middle Ages, as they said in the play. We don't want to go back to that time. Um, but the idea is when someone enters into sanctuary, they enter into the protection of a, of a church, of a sensitive location, um, that being said, if the memo around sensitive locations went away tomorrow, we would still do the work. <laughs> it doesn't depend on, you know, the permission of Trump, um, obviously. Um, and so um, you you stay here and you and people do not leave the church. So so people call it a golden prison a lot of times because it is um, a beautiful thing and a heartbreaking thing at the same time. But they just don't they don't just enter into the protection of a church where they live their, their life until their case can be resolved, but also they enter into the protection of an organized community that is advocating for, for their deportation case to be resolved in a way that allows them to stay within, within the country. Thank you. And I think this is the last question. And this one's for Elisar. Elisar? Uh, does that l that law that you or that w the thing that that makes churches sensitive a safe location. space as what is it sensitive location. a sensitive location does that help the worker center that the worker center is here con esa ley le ayuda absolutamente that's that was the reason I still here because it's a sanctuary for me. I'm not from Central America, but I was someone who was dreaming to have a better life with his family. And I'm here, and who say things are easy? It wasn't easy. There was 
something I was going to say about that, and I completely forgot. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, day laborers are probably the most vulnerable um, in terms of this administration. They are the ones who are like the most persecuted and the ones who are most scapegoated. Um, and and um, they're kind of the the idea that Trump tries to ar- to invoke when um, when he's trying to really um, just just be particularly anti-immigrant. And so um, it's it's an honor for us to be able to stand um, stand with the day laborers and, and hopefully provide them a safer place to be. I will just mention one other thing. A big part of the hospitality, a big part of who we are as a church is we we want to consider ourselves and I think people do consider us a hub. Um, for a lot of the social justice work that happens here um, in Tucson, and that's something that we have a lot of. Um, there's people always here. Half of Tucson has keys to this place, <laughs> um, and we're we're about to we're renovating. We're about to we're not we're not um, uh, Mark said at the beginning. We're not um, we're not uh, demolishing. Thank you. The old sanctuary. We're renovating it and demolishing the Fellowship Hall wing, which is just which is dreadful, beloved but dreadful. Um, and so we're still in the midst of fundraising. So if you want to support the work of Sanctuary, the work of Southside, you can donate online, especially to those who are streaming. I was going to ask if people want to support Southside Presbyterian Church and want to find out more about it, where, where would they go? Southsidepresbyterian.org. Cool. All right. Well, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you.